Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> we'll call this here into order. And I want to thank our witnesses for, uh, uh, for being here. In my four years as chairman, the Committee on Small Business has held more than 20 hearings examining the effects of regulations on small businesses and the economy. However, few regulations examined uh, at these previous hearings are as expansive and potentially damaging to small businesses as the recently proposed Waters of the United States rule. This rule, as currently drafted, could extend the regulatory reach of the Clean Water Act to thousands of small streams, ditches, ponds, and other isolated waters, some of which have very little or no connection to traditionally navigable waterways. The agency claims that the proposed rule will increase clarity as uh, to which waters are subjected uh, to the Clean Water Act jurisdiction. However, this proposed rule creates more confusion, not less. Terms like neighboring, floodplain, riparian area, tributary, and significant nexus are vaguely defined and fail to clarify where the clean water jurisdiction will end. Under this proposed rule, farmers, ranchers, home builders, and a variety of other small businesses could find their lands and livelihoods subject to the Clean Water Act jurisdiction for the very first time. And the burdens of this regulatory regime extend beyond the need to obtain federal permits. It will also require costly and time-consuming mitigation activities and project modifications. And while this proposed rule clearly has significant consequences for small businesses, the EPA and Army Corps of Engineers failed to assess those impacts. Had the agencies conducted research to uh, and gotten input from small businesses as required by the Regulatory Flexibility Act, perhaps they would have identified and fixed some of the problems with the rule before it was proposed. This rule threatens to drown small businesses in unnecessary regulatory requirements, and for that reason, I hope the EPA and the Corps uh, will withdraw the rule and conduct the required small business impact analysis and outreach before proceeding. And again, I want to thank all of our uh, witnesses for being here, each one of you. Uh, we look forward to your testimony. I now yield to Ranking Member Velasquez for her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, since its establishment in 1970, the Environmental <coughs> Protection Agency has been vital to protecting public health and safety. Over the last 40 years, a series of laws passed by Congress has placed greater responsibility on the agency for ensuring the water we drink and the air we breathe is safe and not a threat to human health. Most of us, including many on both sides of the aisle, likely agree that the goals of the EPA protecting our health and environment should be a priority. Reducing pollution and environmental risk is not only important to public health, but carries important economic benefits as well. However, as the EPA carries out its vital mission, it must always be mindful of how new rules and regulations impact our nation's small businesses. One of the EPA's primary responsibilities is the enforcement of the Clean Water Act, whose implementation is shared in part with the Army Corps of Engineers. Through these steps and the implementation of the Act, Americans are healthier, our waterways are being remediated, and as a result, many industries are seeing greater opportunities. In light of this, it is clear that no small business wants our water supply to be compromised. In fact, we have heard time and again in this committee how entrepreneurs are pioneering many of the clean technologies that are reducing pollution. Still, when we talk about regulations, the truth of the matter is that such rules all, almost always impact small firms. Today, we will examine one such regulation, the EPA's and Army Corps proposed rule redefining which waters are subject to the Clean Water Act. Under this proposal, new bodies of water will become subject to the Act, while others will be excluded. Additionally, steps are taken to preserve federal exemptions for normal farming and ranching activities, such as irrigation and the runoff of stormwater, activities that are often undertaken by small farms. Regardless, these changes will result in winners and losers, and unfortunately, some small businesses, particularly those involved in construction and ag agriculture, will likely be subject to greater regulatory costs. It is important to note, however, that there are many sectors also dominated by small businesses which will benefit. This includes companies engaged in recreation, tourism, hunting, fishing, and boating. For those companies, 
their livelihood is often tied to clean water. This rule also brings with it broader economic benefits, making our drinking water safer and providing farms with clean water to irrigate their crops. On balance, it appears that there will be small businesses on both sides of this issue. Regardless, small businesses need a rule that works for everyone, not just a few. With this in mind, it is concerning that no regulatory flexibility analysis was performed. While the agency certified that this proposed rule will not have a significant economic impact on a substantial number of small entities, it provided no justification for this finding. Such agency indifference is something that this committee is all too familiar with. Similarly, the EPA's analysis found that there was no need to conduct a small business advocacy review panel, a special requirement for the EPA. During today's hearing, I am interested in witnesses' perspectives on the agency's rationale for not taking these steps. These issues are not new to this committee. It is critical that as new rules are developed, small businesses' interests must be balanced against our desire to preserve the environment. Central to this is making sure small firms have the ability to provide input and make substantive comments throughout the regulatory process. Today, I hope to hear very clearly how EPA con concluded or did not conduct outreach to small firms. I want to know what is working and what is not, and most of all, how the process can be improved. Such steps are critical, especially as we continue to consider changes to the Regulatory Flexibility Act. As with most regulatory matters, there are small businesses on both sides of this issue. And given this, it is important that we hear from them. The reality is that small firms and their job creating potential are central to our economy, as is a clean and healthy environment. Balancing these twin goals has never been more important and more difficult. And I look forward to today's hearing to gain insight into this very matters. With that, I thank our witnesses for their participation and yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. If any of the committee members have an opening statement prepared, I'd ask you to submit it so we can include it uh, in the record. I'd also like to take just a minute to explain the lights. Um, there's five minutes uh, for testimony, and when it comes down to one minute, uh, the yellow light will come up, and we ask uh, that you try to adhere to that. If you go over, we're not going to stop you. Um, and with that, um, we'll start with introductions, and our first witness is Jack Field. Um, he's the owner of a small commercial cattle operation, the Lazy JF Cattle Company in Wakima, Washington. Mr. Field also serves as the Executive Vice President of the Washington Cattlemen's Association, and in that role, he works with livestock producers and educates them about state and federal water quality regulations. Mr. Field is also a member of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. He's testifying today on behalf of both organizations. Thanks for being here and coming all this way, and uh, we look forward to your testimony. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. My name is Jack Field. I'm a cattle rancher from Yakima, Washington, and the Executive Vice President of the Washington Cattlemen's Association. WCA is an affiliate of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, of which I'm also a member. Thank you to the Chairman and the Ranking Member for allowing me to testify today on the impacts of the EPA and Army Corps' proposed expanded definitions of waters of the United States. I will also provide my concerns with the interpretive rule that was promulgated alongside this proposal. I own and manage 120 head of cattle, which is about the average number of cattle for a rancher in the U.S., which means the average producer falls under what the law considers a small business. My cattle drink from tanks, which I pump from a stream so I can protect potential bull trout habitat. They also water from irrigation ditches, ponds, creeks, seeps, and puddles that they find. It is important to me and my operation to have clean water. The cattle industry prides itself on being good stewards of our country's natural resources. We maintain open spaces, healthy rangelands, and provide wildlife habitat. We also provide the country with those juicy ribeyes we love to throw on the grill on summer days like today. To provide these important functions, cattlemen must be able to operate without excessive federal burdens like the one we're discussing today. As a producer and the head of a state association, I can tell you, after reading this proposal, the potential to negatively impact, it has the potential to negatively impact every aspect of my operation by dictating land use activities in Washington State from 2,600 miles away. After reading the proposal, I can say one thing is clear, this proposal is not clear. There are undefined terms and phrases throughout the rule. The proposal would include ditches of the, as waters of the U.S. if a regulator can distinguish a bed, a bank, and an ordinary high-water mark. 
The proposal would also make everything within a floodplain and a riparian area a water by considering them adjacent waters. The result, to, the result could be to eliminate the use of my entire uh, summer pasture was located wholly in a floodplain. As you can see, looking on the screen, I have a ditch running through my pasture. Cattle uh, utilize this for drinking. In my judgment, this could, e this could easily qualify as a water of the U.S., opening me and my ranch up to significant liability. Not only could I be required to obtain a 404 permit for grazing cows in the pasture, but making it a federal water there are now considerations under the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, and the Endangered Species Act due to the federal decision making in granting and denying a permit. There also is a citizen supervision under Section 505 of the Clean Water Act that would keep me up at night. Instead of improving water quality, it is my belief and, and the belief of both WCA and NCB that this proposal will decrease water quality, water quality by discouraging conservation. I recently uh, next picture, uh, completed a voluntary project, which you can see here. I installed a fence that creates a riparian pasture so I can manage grazing that occurs within the riparian area, which also protects water quality. If this proposal and the interpretive rule were enforced when I started this project, I would not have completed it due to the significant legal liability the proposal created. If I implemented a conservation practice that is not on this prescriptive list of 56 practices outlined uh, as part of the interpretive rule, I could fall outside of the exemption and be subject to a 404 dredge and fill program. While this may not have been the intent. This was the result uh, of the proposal. The fence in the picture was cost shared with local dollars from my conservation district, which does not meet the strenuous NRCS standards due to uh, wider uh, post spacing and uh, reduced numbers of wires and stays. I wouldn't go through the hassle um, of obtaining the 404 permit for such a small project like this. Uh, the total total fence was roughly a quarter mile with an approximate cost of $1,400. My estimate in looking at this with NRCS standards, it would cost me additionally another $300 per quarter mile. That may not sound like a lot, but when you expand that over several hundreds of acres and the fencing that goes with that, it adds up. And on a small operation like mine, every dollar counts. Future conservation projects will not be implemented if this interpretive rule and the definitions are allowed to move forward. I couldn't afford to be at risk of, the, of being in violation of the Queen, Clean Water Act with violations and fines that could add up to $37,000 per day and the risk of potential criminal sanctions. I want to do my part for the environment, but I can't if it would jeopardize my entire operation. This didn't have to be the result. All the agencies had to do was to engage stakeholders early in the process, incorporate our suggestions, and we'd be much further along uh, in crafting a rule that actually clarifies the, the scope of the Clean Water Act jurisdiction. Despite what EPA is saying, they did not have a meaningful dialogue with the small business community. There was zero outreach to the agricultural community before the rules proposed and before the interpretive rule went into effect. What we are left with now is a proposal that doesn't work for small businesses, doesn't work for cattle ranchers, and doesn't work for the environment. I would ask that the agencies ditch the rule. Uh, I believe we can do a lot better than this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Field. I am trying to decide if we Try to go through one more witness. Um, we will go through one more witness. Unfortunately, we have had a series of votes called. Um, our next witness is Alan Parks. He is the Vice President of Memphis Stone and Gravel Company, which is a locally owned and operated aggregate supplier in Memphis, Tennessee and North Mississippi. As Vice President, Mr. Parks is involved in all phases of the company's development of sand and gravel resources, including permitting and environmental compliance. And He has a degree in mining and engineering previously worked for the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation. Mr. Parks is testifying on behalf of the National Stone, Sand and Gravel Association. Thanks for being here. Chairman Graves and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify on behalf of the National Stone, Sand and Gravel Association. My name is Alan Parks and I am Vice President of Memphis Stone and Gravel Company, which was started in 1910 and remains a family-owned business. We have eight active mining facilities in Tennessee and Mississippi. There are more than 10,000 construction aggregate operations nationwide. Of particular relevance to this hearing, 70 percent of our members are considered small business. Aggregates are the chief ingredient in asphalt pavement and concrete and used in nearly all building construction. As the industry that provides essential construction materials, we are deeply concerned by EPA's expansion of the Clean Water Act. This would cause further harm to an industry that has seen production drop by 39 percent since 2006. The companies in our industry remove resources from the ground, then process them into usable construction products. 
We do not use or discharge any hazardous chemicals. After we recover these resources, we return the land to other productive uses such as farmland and recreational lakes. While stone, sand and gravel resources may seem to be everywhere, these materials must meet strict technical guidelines to make our roads and infrastructure safe and durable. Unlike other businesses, we cannot simply choose where we operate. We are limited to where natural forces have deposited these materials. Because high quality aggregate deposits were often created by water, they are often located near water. Water management is a significant issue for any company in our industry. EPA claims this rule is needed because so many waters are unprotected. We believe that is not the case. Before breaking ground on any project, we evaluate whether we are affecting jurisdictional water, which requires consultation with the Corps and State officials. There is an extensive review of all of our projects to ensure compliance with local, state and federal rules governing how we can or cannot affect land and water resources. While there are many inefficiencies in the current regulatory system, adding vague terms and undefined concepts to an already complicated program is not the way to improve the process. For example, EPA states groundwater is excluded from this rule, but the rule also says that shallow subsurface connections are included. Does this mean that water that fills our pits is jurisdictional? From Memphis Stone and Gravel Company's point of view, it would be a rare event not to encounter shallow groundwater and sand and gravel deposits. Will a separate permit be required for reclaiming the pit and returning it to another beneficial use? These are just some of the many questions this rule poses but does not answer. Having a clear jurisdictional determination for each site is critical to the aggregates industry. These decisions impact the planning, financing, construction and operating of our facilities. Because the Clean Water Act dredge and fill permit and the corresponding state's 401 certification process is so long and costly for a small company like ours, we attempt to void jurisdictional areas. Now under the proposed revisions, many previously non-jurisdictional areas could be considered jurisdictional. It will make nearly any area we try to access require additional permits. The delay caused by multiple surveys, reports and additional authorizations will add significant new costs during the permitting process, which could lead to abandoning projects once considered viable. One NSSGA member calculated that to do the additional mitigation of a stream required under this rule would be more than $100,000. This is just one site and one project in our industry. We make business decisions to buy or lease properties for 15 to 30 years in advance of our operations. A change in what is considered jurisdictional can have a significant impact on our material reserves, which will affect the life of our facilities and delay the startup of new sites. If it is determined that development of a site will take too long or cost too much to acquire permits or perform mitigation, we won't move forward. That means a whole host of economic activity in the community will not occur. Given that infrastructure investment is essential to economic rec recovery and growth, any change in the way land use is regulated places additional burden on the aggregates industry. This is a serious change in the rules that dictate how we can or cannot conduct business. NSSGA appreciates this opportunity to speak on this matter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will be happy to respond to any questions. Thank you, Mr. Parks. And with that, uh, we'll break. We've got a 15-minute vote and four five-minute votes uh, at this point, so we shouldn't be too terribly long. Uh, but uh, I'd ask everybody to uh, uh, stay and, and uh, come back. Um, but I apologize for this. Uh, the ranking member and I don't get to make the schedule on voting, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, we will be back shortly. So the committee is in recess. All right, we'll go ahead and call the hearing back to order. Our next witness is going to be Tom Woods, who's a home builder with more than 40 years' experience in the home building industry. He's the president of Woods Custom Homes, a building company based in Blue Springs, Missouri, uh, in my district. Tom serves as the or 2014 first vice chairman of the board of the National Association of Home Builders and is testifying on behalf of that association. Tom, thanks for being here today. I look forward to your testimony. Chairman Graves and members of the subcommittee, I appreciate this opportunity to testify today. 
My name is Tom Woods, and I am the president of Woods Custom Homes, based in Blue Springs, Missouri, and NHB's 2014 first vice chairman of the board. Since its inception, the Clean Water Act has made significant strides in improving the quality of our water resources. Home builders have a vested interest in the protection of our water resources. Home building is one of the most regulated activities in this country, and as a small business owner, I can tell you that the key to a successful regulatory regime is consistency, predictability, timeliness, while focusing on protecting true aquatic resources. When it comes to the Clean Water Act, we get none of that. For years, landowners and regulators alike have been frustrated with the confusion over what are waters of the United States. When the EPA and the Army Corps proposed this most recent rule, we hoped it would finally provide clarity and certainty. Unfortunately, the rule falls well short of that goal. The rule establishes broader definitions of existing regulatory categories, such as tributaries, and seeks to regulate new areas that are not currently federally regulated, such as adjacent non-wetlands, riparian areas, floodplains, and other waters. The agencies intentionally created overly broad terms so they have the authority to interpret them. Under this rule, the federal government would regulate roadside ditches or water features that may flow only after a heavy rainfall. I'm a businessman. I need to know the rules. I can't play a guessing game of, is it federally jurisdictional? But that's just what this proposal would force me to do. Builders would face new costly delays just waiting for the agencies to determine if a road ditch is a water of the United States. The only winners are the lawyers, as this rule will certainly lead to increased litigation. My business has already been a victim of permitting delays. For one of my building projects, I was entangled in an Army Corps permitting process for over two years. These delays will only increase as the agency works to extend federal protection to smaller waters. While many aspects of the Clean Water Act are vague, it is clear that Congress intended to create a partnership between the federal agencies, the state governments, to protect our nation's water resources. There is a point where federal authority ends and state authority begins. Unfortunately, defining that point has proven incredibly difficult. States have adequately regulated their own waters and wetlands for years. As a former mayor, I have a firsthand understanding of the, leaks that, uh, the lengths that the state and local governments go in order to protect their waters. The agencies have bypassed the safeguards of the Regulatory Flexibility Act by failing to consider the true economic costs on small business. Since the agencies fail to hold a small business panel, it is clear that they are not interested in hearing from small businesses like mine. Unfortunately, all too often the EPA completely ignored the RFA requirements. The agency's economic analysis of the proposed rule failed to consider the economic impact on small businesses and is therefore fatally flawed. According to economist Dr. David Sundling, the errors and omission in EPA's study are so severe as to render it virtually meaningless. That should give us all pause. It is clear that the APA should withdraw the economic analysis and prepare a more thorough and accurate analysis. Any final rules should provide understandable definitions and preserve the partnership between all levels of government, while also considering the impacts on small businesses. All are sorely lacking here. I request that the agency start over and develop a more meaningful and balanced rule that respects the spirit of the RFA. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today.
Mr. Chairman, it is my, my pleasure to introduce Professor William Bosby. Professor Bosby is a professor of law at Emory University School of Law, where he is also the director of the Environmental and Natural Resources Law Program. He will next be joining the faculty of Georgetown Law Center. Before becoming a professor, he counseled industry, municipalities, and governmental authorities about environmental law, pollution control, and land use uses issues. Professor Busby has written extensively about related issues with a focus on regulatory federalism. Welcome. Thank you very much, and thank you to all the members of the committee. Um, I'm pleased to accept the invitation to testify before the committee. I'm, I think I was invited to testify due to my expertise, not as a partisan or representative of any organization. So what I'll try to do is provide a little bit of context about what's going on with these proposed regulations and offer a few comments about the legality and logic of the regulations. Um, I should add that uh, this isn't my first involvement with the question of what is waters of the United States. Um, earlier, I represented a bipartisan group of former EPA administrators before the Supreme Court in the Rapanos case. Uh, they were aligned with the George W. Bush administration in trying to uphold the longstanding protections of the regulations about waters of the United States. And then subsequently, I testified at a few hearings about the very confusing ruling that emerged. Um, I'll make five main points in my testimony. Uh, first, uh, although people have focused on wetlands protections, it's important to understand that what is a water of the United States is the linchpin of the whole Clean Water Act, including pollution discharges from industry, oil, and other sorts of spills and water concerns. Second, um, there have been some comments uh, about these regulations questioning if they are legal and responsive to what the Supreme Court has done in three major cases, and I will show that they are. Um, in addition, there have been persistent claims, and we have heard some today, uh, that the regulatory claims here are too broad, uh, and I will show how these proposed regulations actually cut back on EPA and the Army Corps' uh, jurisdiction. Um, very importantly, um, the regulations here linked to, uh, are linked to a massive survey of peer-reviewed science on wetlands. And in an era when people think agencies should respect sound science and peer-reviewed science, it is important to acknowledge that is the underpinning of this regulation. And then lastly, I will show how the regulations here um, uh, reduce a commerce-linked rationale that long has been an underpinning of Federal power. So first, um, again, uh, important to understand the Clean Water Act, waters of the United States, is the entire root of Federal power here. So if you are concerned about industrial discharges into America's waters, uh, industrial discharges into what might be a dry riverbed in the southwest and what would happen during a heavy rain flow, that is as much a concern as is wetlands filling. Um, it is important to keep that in mind. And certainly given the importance of fishing industries, the use of waters for drinking water, municipal uses and the like, protecting waters is of critical importance uh, across the entire nation. Businesses are on all sides of this issue. Um, second, um, uh, this point about people's claim that this is an illegal uh, uh, grab of power beyond what the Supreme Court has allowed, this is clearly incorrect. Six Supreme Court justices in the Rapanos case uh, agreed that EPA and the Army Corps by regulation could clarify what counts as a water of the United States. Um, and then earlier in a case called Riverside Bayview Homes, a unanimous Supreme Court also talked about this being an area appropriate for rulemaking authority. Uh, there is no doubt this is uh, something where authority exists. People may skirmish over what the appropriate bounds are, but is there room for rulemaking here? The answer is absolutely. Point three, um, uh, are these, uh, is people have failed to acknowledge that in these regulations for the first time, the Army Corps and EPA have very explicitly carved out jurisdiction, saying they will no longer assert jurisdiction in several areas uh, I won't list them off in depth because of the limited time, but it includes waste treatment systems, prior converted cropland, ditches that are upland and don't contribute flow to other waters. Um, and really, if you look through these, uh, several of them seem to be a direct answer to some previous testimony where people have talked about efforts to regulate puddles and meaningless things like gutters and bird feeders. Uh, they have clearly said they are not reaching uh, out to the outermost limits. Um, the peer-reviewed science, point four has to do with the peer-reviewed science. The, 
Um, I'm sure it's great and riveting reading for all of us, but there is a 300 some odd page science report that goes through all of the peer reviewed science on why you should protect waters. And the proposed regulations here tie in very directly. And so, again, that is an important uh, change now with, in these regulations, really hin hin uh, hinging federal jurisdiction to that science. Now, um, point five, uh, in my last few seconds, is there was a longstanding uh, regulation in 328.3A, or A3, I'm sorry, uh, that allowed the Federal Government to assert jurisdiction over disputed waters if they could show the harm or the use of waters was linked to commerce and industry. Um, and EPA and the Army Corps have deleted that provision. And so they no longer are asserting that. At this point, under these regulations, all jurisdiction is hinged to what the science shows about the need to protect waters. Um, so I will stop there. Thank you very much, members. Thank you very much. We are going to start questions with Mr. Tipton. Is Jamie here? Mr. Hollis Camp. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, moving to the front of the line here. That kind of surprised me a little bit. Gentlemen, thanks uh, for your testimony. I apologize for uh, Mr. Field coming and winning the award for uh, traveling the furthest distance. Oftentimes coming from halfway across the country, I wish I were further away from the regulators in, in Washington. But uh, appreciate your description of what actually happens on a ranch and uh, what uh, you fear these regu proposed regulations might do for you. It certainly is a vast overreach. And certainly, uh, being in agriculture myself, I, I'm worried about what happens, whether it's dry stream beds, uh, backyard ponds. Uh, you know, we wish we actually had road ditches with water in them. But uh, I understand, uh, my understanding of the rule would mean that uh, they would have a regulatory uh, nexus uh, from, from Washington to uh, interfere with those as well. And creating that regulatory uncertainty and this fast overreach is, is creating some problems. I wish uh, for, for Mr. Field and Mr. Parks, if you describe a little further what, uh, what changes you believe you might have to make. Uh, and again, that's the difficulty, is the regulatory uncertainty. Uh, because this is not the first time there's been a propo proposal to strike the word navigable and say, hey, that doesn't count anymore, even though uh, that's uh, certainly the intention of Congress. So if you describe a little more uh, specifically what you think you might have to do and, uh, and the cost of, of, of doing those in the future. Absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman. And the biggest question, as you've highlighted, is being asked to explain hypothetically what will happen when, when I can't clearly tell you what the rule means is, is very difficult, but I will do my very best. The biggest challenge, and I reference this list, this is a list of the 56 pre-approved practices that uh, EPA has deemed are not going to create a discharge if an individual, and these are related to farming and agricultural activities, if an individual executes those as prescribed by NRCS. So just for my example, and we talked a little bit earlier about uh, fencing or prescribed grazing. I have, uh, clearly it would create additional expense and burden on my operation to have to go through and create NRCS approved grazing plans to ensure that in areas where I have a riparian pasture, if I have a fence that touches that riparian area, meaning if it floods at any time of the year and then that water drains back into a tributary which the EPA may deem has connectivity under their broad definition of authority, I then, if I am not grazing uh, in accordance to my NRCS approved plan, would, could be found out of uh, compliance, thus being required to obtain a 404 permit for cattle grazing in a riparian area. Hearing, hearing the good gentleman to my, my uh, right speak about the challenges they have in obtaining permits for constructing homes, I have no expectation whatsoever to do that. I'm a small, extremely small business, got 55 mama cows. That's one truckload. I can't afford an attorney or an environmental consultant. Uh, I'd like to think I'm a fairly intelligent individual being able to read uh, the law, but I can't honestly tell you what the expense would mean to my operation in terms of uh, compliance with the environmental regulation. I, I want clean water. I drink the same water uh, that my neighbors down the stream do. Uh, I want good, clean groundwater. I want clean surface water. But the best, in my opinion, the best way we get there is through local decisions, and that happens at the local level in the state and county. Thank you, Mr. Field. Mr. Parks? If I could sum this up in three words, I'd say cost, <laughs> delay, and uncertainty. Uh, those are going to be the big three things that come out of this. Uh, I believe that uh, increased regulated area is going to be significant. 
Um, I think one concern that we have is we have developed a level of competency over the years understanding how to play this game. And now the rules are going to change significantly. So there is going to be a, a pretty significant learning curve for that, both for the regulated community as well as those that are in charge of regulating. Uh, that causes delay, and there is a cost to that. Uh, we make substantial investments on these natural resources. Uh, we lease those uh, many years down the road. And we are concerned that uh, because jurisdictional determinations are subject to review every five years, you know, what is going to happen to deposits that we have banked on mining that are now going to be off limits? Uh, so there is a, you know, a lot of uncertainty that, that exists with this, and it creates a potential for a much, much broader regulated area. Ms. Parks, one last quick follow-up uh, as far as uh, planning ahead. How, how many years out do you uh, make purchases in order to secure those deposits? Uh, I mean, certainly more than five years. Absolutely. Uh, it's not uncommon. Typically in the 15 to 30-year range is what most of our leases uh, our terms are. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. <coughs> Ranking Member Velasquez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Professor Bosby, you indicated in your testimony that while some small businesses have, have come out against uh, the proposed rule. There are business interests on both sides. Uh, can you explain why is there this split? Um, yes. Um, based on past, if you kind of track who supported changes, uh, who's testified, and who's participated in some of the Supreme Court cases, um, there are very substantial interests linked to hunting and fishing as one area. Um, and then there's also commercial fishing on large scale, which is very much dependent on uh, rivers and their tributaries. Uh, in addition, recreational interests are huge business in the United States, and they very much depend on this. Uh, while not first level small business, municipal uses of the waters that we're trying to protect through the Clean Water Act, it has a direct effect on many businesses who depend on safe and good water for their businesses. So if you've looked historically, uh, the reason why there's been there was for about 30 years really bipartisan support across bi across party lines was that people realized it was both good environmentally and good business to have improved clean waters. Um, it appears that the main fear of many is that the proposed rule would broaden scope um, of the Clean Water Act and that there will be limitless claims of federal power. Uh, if this is an accurate criticism of the proposed rule? Um, no, it's not. It's not an accurate description. As I said, the uh, first there is for the first time an explicit carve out of a number of areas. Plus, very importantly, there is the explicit deletion of this long-standing commerce link grounds for jurisdiction. Um, and then there are also several other grounds that have long been explicit in the Clean Water Act, and they remain. Um, you know, very importantly here is what EPA and the Corps have done is they set three categories. They have some areas they call jurisdictional, then they have others and they talk about them by category and why, and then they have others that still require case-by-case -case analysis for a significant nexus. And so while I do think there's concerns with delay any time you have a case-specific judgment, it also gives people the chance, uh, whether they're building houses or working on a cattle ranch, to argue about whether an area deserves protection. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Field, you indicated that there was zero outreach uh, to the uh, agriculture community be before the rule was proposed and that you were told to wait and see. Why do you think there was this reluctance uh, from EPA uh, to uh, have input from those uh, stakeholders? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would. I can't. I, I can't answer why EPA failed to reach out. Uh, however, it's clear to see the result that we're, we're experiencing. We're experiencing it right now. And just, if I may answer a follow-up to the professor's comment mm -hmm. regarding uh, the Section 505 of the Clean Water Act, I would argue adamantly that the citizen suit provision is by far anything but clear. Having the opportunity as we drive down the road to simply pick up the phone and contact EPA and say, I question an, an activity that's occurring. I think there's a discharge. Click. That's an anonymous call. We as landowners, the, the target of the call, never have an opportunity to know who's making the call, who's making the claim. And I have seen this happen in Washington State where 
the citizens the opportunity to make anonymous calls leads to countless inspections, follow-up, and does nothing in terms of protecting water quality but causing a, a continuous do loop. Um, but but to back to your point in terms of outreach, um, the, the, it, it's beyond frustrating as to why EPA did not reach out. I know in February at the National Cattlemen's uh, Annual meeting, uh, EPA was asked that very question, and they were told to wait and see what the proposal looked so like. So now that you have this forum, um, so you have the opportunity to tell me and the committee what is the number one concern or complaint that you have regarding the proposed rule? The absolute vagueness. It's a dramatic overreach, in my opinion, of what the original intent was and the idea that simply having again to show a bed, a bank and an ordinary high water mark, then being able to make the deem that it's adjacent, that's limitless. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Woods, in your testimony you point to an economist um, who found that EPA's cost-benefit analysis was flawed because it used a time period in which there was low construction activity as its baseline. During the time construction spending was 24 percent below that of the previous two years. Can you give us a sense of what the true cost will be if the analysis had used a period that was more reflective of the construction industry? I can only give you a, uh, uh, a uh, guesstimate, I guess I would say. You, if you look at 2009-2010, yes, they are 24 percent behind 2007-2008. Uh, However, remember 2008 was the absolute cliff. Yeah. You, construction overall dropped by 80 percent. So if you take that as a number, you can assume that there would be five times the permits if we were able to get back to a normal uh, construction. So if there were five times the permits, um, there would be at least a minimum of five times the cost. Um, and uh, I see very little benefit whatsoever. That's the other flaw in the thing. Uh, the, there will be cost and, in my estimation, no benefit. And, and if I might, uh, the other problem you have here when you say a cost benefit and the way I think their method is flawed because your real cost, not only the, the physical cost of hiring the attorneys and the consultants to go through this process, but your real cost in the construction industry is in the time because houses have very short time periods. They have very short commitments on loans and appraisals and those kind of things. And if you stretch it out, those commitments are usually only six months. Okay. If you stretch it out, you just lost those sales. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Uh, Professor uh, Busby, uh, one of the concerns that has been expressed is um, how the proposed rule will affect their businesses. And uh, among those uh, is the fear that the new rule will subject you to lawsuits. Mm -hmm. My question to you is, what safeguards are there in the Act that will prevent businesses being subject to an unmerited uh, lawsuit? Um, it, well, first, the, the, the most important thing is first that you have an Army Corps of Engineers that in making jurisdictional determinations does react with alacrity and reviews that and gives people back prompt, gives people prompt feedback. That is essential. Um, citizen suits are actually very hard to bring, and that's actually only when people go to law, go into the courts, uh, and I, whether phone tips or something like that, is, would be a, a, a different issue. But um, and so in the end, they would have to basically show that there was a violation uh, and convince a court and show that they were harmed by it, and that's difficult. Uh, and I think for that reason, you often, there are not as many, you don't hear about yes. a lot of Section 404 water related, uh, waters of the United States related citizen litigation suits. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Tipton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I'd like to thank our panel for taking the time to be here. I, I have to tell you, gentlemen, I think this is the greatest water grab that we have seen by the federal government in the history of the United States. Uh, the overreach of the EPA in terms of being able to control. Uh, Mr. Field, you're out of the West. Uh, yes, it sir. is a private property right. Absolutely correct. You have state law 
in the West. We have priority-based systems, and we're now seeing the federal government trying to be able to step in to be able to regulate virtually all of the waters of the United States. When you read through this, traditional navigable waters, interstate waters and wetlands, territorial seas, impoundments of the first three categories and tributaries, tributaries of the first four categories, waters and wetlands adjacent to the first five categories, and other waters. Does that sound like everything to you, Mr. Field? It sounds to me once that drop falls out of the sky, it's under uh, EPA's jurisdiction. It's going to be under the EPA's jurisdiction. Uh, you were just talking about the ditch that you diverted off the stream to be able to get water to your cattle, to be able to get, irrigate, I assume, uh, some of your fields so that you can actually grow hay, uh, some feed for the cattle. How's this going to impact your business? I honestly can't tell you that. That's why I'm here, sir. The uh, the picture that we had is an irrigation ditch. There's about a f uh, acre foot of water that flows through that to a few of my neighbors right now. And the question I have, and the sincere fear, is the riparian pasture that's between that irrigation ditch and the the tributary uh, that flows to a water of the U.S. And the question of am I in violation of the Clean Water Act? I subject myself to more liability today by putting the pictures on the screen and talking than I can afford to pay. Now, do you have every sense, uh, if the EPA is allowed to be able to move forward with these rules, it's no longer your land, no longer your property, no longer your water, that it is now owned by the federal government and will be controlled out of Washington? That's most certainly a concern, I think, that's shared by every private landowner. And an additional fear that I have, and in speaking with Mr. Parks, that I think would be echoed on other natural resource industries, is the concern that this rule, if it goes forward uh, unchanged and unamended, that it may have a chilling impact on landowners who may not be directly involved. I lease all of my property for grazing. This may have a chilling impact, and landowner might say, boy, Jack, I'd love to help you out and lease some pasture, but I'm afraid your activity brings too much liability under the Clean Water Act. Go maybe try the neighbor. Yeah, I, I think, you know, because I, I, I think we can agree. Everybody in this room is an environmentalist. We all like clean air, and we all like clean water. You were describing for us an effort that you had made in terms of being able to put in some conservation now, if these rules move forward, if the overreach of the federal government is put into place, uh, you aren't going to be able to afford, nor would you be willing to move into those conservation areas. Is that correct? Well, you're, you're absolutely correct. I would certainly not uh, partner with NRCS or my conservation district. Yeah. I would try to do what I can at a much slower pace just on my own because, the, and don't get me wrong, I don't have, the NRCS standards are an excellent. They work perfectly, but I don't need to implement those practices exactly to the standard. I can get by with a three-strand high tensile fence uh, that I can build in a much faster time than a four or five-strand barbed wire fence delivers the exact same benefits at a much lower cost. And again, on my operation, I've got to try to spread the dollar just as everybody else on this panel as far as we can. You know, and, I, and just for the point of clarity, I happen to view our farm and ranch community as part of our national defense. We certainly need to be able to feed this country. Uh, did you state, and did I write this down correctly, there was zero, zero out outreach by the EPA to the ag community. Is that correct? Yes, sir. There was questions were made in February requesting for meaningful dialogue and input, and again, being told to wait and see. And that's unfortunately not a very productive means of promulgating rule, and especially something that will be this effective. Or so an agency that, that says you will follow the rules doesn't follow its own rules when it comes to being able to reach out and find out what the business impacts are going to be. Mr. Parks, would you like to comment on that? Uh, yes, sir, I would. Um, fortunately, our company is a member of a, of a great trade association who made us aware of these developments and keeps us informed, keeps us informed and in the loop. Um, you know, the Home Builders Association, National Cattlemen's Association, they, that, that's the type of, of uh, you know, that's why we're members of these associations. Uh, by and large, uh, we don't have the management and the support staff to, to stay engaged with these types of issues. Uh, I would say, for the most part, the small business community has a cursory understanding of what's being proposed at best, and, and most folks have, have no idea the enormity that these changes could bring to the regulated community. I see I'm out of time. Gentlemen, I thank you for your comments, and I share your concerns over this overreach by the government and the EPA. Mr. Schrager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I guess uh, I find Mr. Professor Busby's testimony 
on those five points actually pretty incredulous. Uh, respect his uh, previous experience and expertise, but uh, the idea that this is a simple definition of what are the United States, uh, we've heard from people that live, work, and try and build our great country and the economy that uh, that's not the case. This is a vast expansion. Matter of fact, uh, it's not legally responsive even to the courts. Let's go back to the Supreme Court decision, Professor Busby. Uh, it was supposed to be about navigable rivers or have some juxtaposition or nexus to navigable rivers. CWA does not include every bloody water in the United States of America. It's supposed to be dealing with those rivers that actually have some nexus to navigability. Otherwise, to uh, the good gentleman from Colorado's point, it becomes a, a grab of private property uh, throughout the United States of America. That was not what the CWA was all about. Uh, I think uh, the fact that this is actually not a broad interpretation is ludicrous. We have 56 different exceptions, and I bet, Mr. Field, are you confident every single exception that they're going to come up with is listed right there? There are going to be some others you're going to run up against? Uh, you're absolutely correct. This is, uh, again, the list. If you follow the 56 pre-approved NRCS practices by the, by the letter, you would be exempt. But if you, again, I could, Do my anything. fence, yeah. I, not having an NRCS plan, it doesn't meet the standard. I don't fall under the exemption. Well, and I think that's, uh, that's unfortunately going to be the case for everybody. Uh, the, the commerce cause deletion almost is a, a, a direct contravention to, from the plurality's decision in the Supreme Court. You're supposed to still take the navigability piece into consideration. Even Justice Kennedy talks about significant nexus in his decision. There's none of that, none of that with EPA. We're on primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, septuagenarial relationships to navigability here. This is ludicrous. I mean, I don't think anybody in a straight face can say that this is anything but a huge grab of jurisdictional power at the end of the day. Let's talk about peer-reviewed research here. Uh, I guess I'm a little concerned about how committed the EPA was as they developed this rule to coming up with, you know, the accepted peer-reviewed research when their own EPA draft study, Connectivity of Streams of Wetlands to Downstream Waters, a review and synthesis of the scientific evidence, was sent to the EPA Science Advisory Board to begin review on the same day they sent their final rule to OMB. I mean, that's, uh, if you're talking about peer-reviewed science and actually watching science, they don't even follow their own gall darn science. I mean, that, that's an indictment that I think is uh, beyond the pale here. All I know is that back in Oregon, you know, we have a lot of federal land, just like every Western state legislator here. And uh, we have a tough time dealing with all the federal rules on a regular basis. And what we're seeing here is, unfortunately, more rules, more regulations. I think Mr. Park summed it up nicely. More cost. More delay, more uncertainty. Even if it doesn't go to lawsuit, no, Professor Busby, not every dang small businessman has a lawyer in their pocket that they have on retainer that they can fight these things. The threat of someone driving down the highway, seeing a practice, and they're worried about it, all of a sudden you've got EPA or my state, DEQ, coming in investigating you. That costs a business money. This is an abomination. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Schweiker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we did in a little work group about a month ago with a number of, sort of uh, lawyers who basically work in this area, environmental law, and we said sort of a game theory. We read through the rule and basically turned to those who it was within their specialty and said, take it to an extreme, take it to the, what you maximize the language. And so, Professor, uh, I, I was going to ask for your help on, on a couple things that still echo in my, in my mind. Um, a river that only once every 100 years, uh, or, 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 let me back up, a wash that only on occasion contributes to a navigable stream, um, does that wash fall under these rules? Um, I, I think the way they've set them up, they have... They are proposing to look by different regions to figure out, but if an area is a dry riverbed in an area that is, say, Arizona, an area that is, uh, tends to be dry, that has major rain torrents that come down, and during those times water is carried on, that, it that, would fall that under. I believe that it would fall under during, for okay. those instances. So 
because uh, I remember some of the sitting through a meeting on this, um, Lordy, uh, 15, 20 years ago, where the Salt River bed, which we dammed up before statehood. So it's basically been dry for 100 years, except for that 100-year flood that we had a few years, uh, actually back in the 80s. Um, and at that time, EPA wanted to designate that as a navigable river. So the wash that goes behind my property, my home, so have a property, big wash under it. Um, when we get our 14 inches of rain a year, which comes on a Tuesday, um, no, it really does. Um, and that would contribute to that dry salt riverbed, and that dry salt riverbed, once every 100 years or so, contributes down to the Colorado, would fall under the rule, right? I don't know about if there's a time limit. I'm not aware. I mean, you're saying once every hundred years. I don't know. I, but, but, but it would, my, my okay. guess is that wouldn't be. But I because they seem to be talking more but, about but, with periodic rainfalls that would be heavy that would flow. So if you're so, saying, so now we're into the definition of periodic, um, ultimately. And my concern is also in this rule. There's also some of the cleanup of the language of we'll call it citizen litigation. You know, the ability, and before speaking to one of the minority members, you said, well, you don't think this happens often. I literally, in Arizona, have multiple law firms that they're, literally their sole practice is suing the Forest Service, suing it, you know, and that's how they make their money. Now, a lot of the suing is actually all about, we'll sue and get a settlement, and that's how we enforce policy. So, um, un under this, could I get sued for the dry wash behind my house that contributes to the dry salt riverbed that contributes eventually to the Colorado River once every 100 years? Um, no, you, under Clean Water Act, you'd have to show that you had discharged a pollutant into the river from a point source, which would mean either industrial discharges or if you went in, say, built a concrete pier blocking it, then there would be a possibility of liability if it was so, jurisdictional. But you can only sue if you have that and there is an advance notice requirement, so they'd have to give you an advance notice so, but, and so, the state but, and but the But that same concept. So in my property, I go out and dig in and plant some desert trees, and I use the appropriate fertilizers for my area. Haven't I just now walked over that line? As far as I know, I'm not aware of that from what I've read. I'm not, I'm not clear if there would be grounds. Okay. I, don't, I it, can't it, see we, one in that. When we modeled it, Mm -hmm. and actually read, read it through line by line. And look, that may not be the intent, but my great fear is, as we've seen over and over and over and over, when we end up, we create, the, these government creates these rules, and then over the next 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, litigation after litigation after litigation, expansion, 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 all of a sudden I'm not allowed to plant a desert tree in the back of my property because there's a wash. And I know that sounds absurd, but I can model you through the language and show you how that reads in there. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Chu? Yes, um, Professor Busby, there has been a representation that uh, nearly every drop of water that falls would be regulated by the federal government, and that even if not every drop of water is regulated, any place that water collects will be including all man-made bodies of water, ponds, ditches, floodplains, and even standing water in potholes. And yet, from what I read, the actual increase of jurisdiction would be 3 percent, which doesn't sound like every body of water that is out there. So could you please clarify that? Um, yes. Um, I agree with your, your read. is consistent with mine that uh, there, is a, there is a clarification of the grounds for jurisdiction, but I don't see a substantial increase. And because of these explicit carve-outs that are now part of the proposed regulations, areas that previously had been raised as a kind of parade of horribles of extensive regulation, I don't think you'd find them. And so, for example, you know, if, if a, there was a mention earlier that just by having cattle grazing that that would create a, a need for Section 404 permit, I'm not aware of any basis for that. Is 3 percent a, a correct number, do you think? Um, I have not looked at that. I have seen other people have estimated 3 percent, but I have not um, myself tried to figure out across the country the percentage. Um, from what I read, um, it, uh, 117 million Americans who consume water from public systems that rely on seasonal or intermittent water sources would have greater protection of their drinking water. Is that true? Yes, it is. That uh, The science does show more and more that protecting 
uh, rivers, riverbeds, and the buffers around them especially is critically important to maintaining water quality both for human use as well as fisheries and other purposes. And so especially for municipalities that depend on water from flowing rivers, maintaining the purity of that water is extremely important. Now, it is my understanding that the EPA is, in proposing these regulations, is actually trying to limit the pollution in our drinking water, and therefore they have to define which waters may be subject to these kinds of pollutants and also carry pollutants downstream. Uh, could you elaborate on that point and help us understand how the definitions of waters facilitates the main goal of protecting constituents from pollution? Sure. Um, it, as you can read in the very extensive proposed regulation, um, a lot of the focus is trying to track, based on peer-reviewed science, how pollutants move through waters from, from areas where the waters collect and then essentially move from tributaries into larger navigable, in fact, waters or traditional navigable waters. Um, and so the, basically they found that both wetlands and tributaries do a tremendous work essentially functioning for free and reducing pollutants. So what eventually goes into the larger water bodies is substantially cleansed by the process itself. Uh, and so in that respect, it is critically important to maintain the purity of water. And then uh, in your testimony, you said that uh, several categories of waters are exempted from the rule. For example, waste treatment systems, prior converted cropland, and several sorts of dish ditches. Um, and could you tell us how and why these exemptions were made and why they are necessary? Um, there had been, I think in some cases, these were kind of in actual enforcement practices were, were largely followed, but there have been a lot of claims of excessive claims of jurisdiction. So uh, looking at their explanation, the view was it was time not to leave them open to debate, but just to make crystal clear, these would not be jurisdictional and that would remove them from any debate and argument. You know, people would not be able to later say, oh, there was a significant nexus. No, these are removed from federal power. Con Congresswoman, if I, if I may, just uh, to, to one question, you had done an excellent job of highlighting the problem with this rule when you asked Professor Busby if, in his opinion, this rule would only yield in 3 percent of additional regulation. The problem is I can bring my attorney and they will argue the opposite, saying, no, I don't think it's 3 percent, I think it's 10 percent. It isn't clear to us what truly is going to be a regulated water under this rule. And the other question in terms of a carve-out on a waste treatment plant, they are regulated under the National Pollution uh, discharge permit. That's an NDPS. That's a point source polluter. That's apples and oranges in this discussion. We're talking about non-point. Well, I still have another question, so if I could continue, Excuse Professor me. Busby. Um, in your testimony, you explained that what appears to be a vague language of the law will actually allow regulators to provide case-by-case -case decisions following site-specific inspections. Can you explain how the law's reliance on case-by-case -case anal analysis will actually allow regulators to adhere more closely to the intent of the Clean Water Act? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, this is partly the outgrowth of uh, Justice Kennedy's opinion in the Rapanos case when he called for a significant nexus analysis, so you wouldn't be regulating marginal in insignificant waters. And so the Army Corps and EPA, in proposing this regulation, have basically tried to figure out what by category does need to be regulated and then carved out certain areas. These are ones that need case-by-case -case analysis. And so um, those ones, it's not clear until you look in particular contexts. They have sought comment, and I assume the colleagues here at the table will provide comments that would analyze by different regions why certain areas might be more likely to be jurisdictional or not. That is something they have sought comment on. Okay, thank you. I yield back. Mr. Collins. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I want to start by thanking Mr. Schrader for his uh, excellent summary of, of the issues that we are bringing. Mr. Schrader and I co-sponsored a letter to the administrator of the EPA as well as the Secretary of the Department of Army that was signed by 231 members of Congress. It is not easy to get members to sign such letters, let alone uh, 231 letters on a bipartisan way, including the chairman of every committee in Congress. So when Professor Busby speaks about the, the, uh, the impact or what he, he would suggest is, is not, as I agree with Mr. Schrader, the greatest expansion, land grab, power grab uh, that's ever occurred in the history of, of the EPA, uh, and certainly I think our testimony from Mr. Field, Mr. Parks, Mr. Woods confirms that. So for the record, I would like to point out to Professor Busby not to nitpick 
but I think it is important, Professor. When you were questioned by Ms. Chu about certain issues, let, let me reiterate how you responded. I am not aware, as far as I know, a possibility. I don't know. My guess is. I believe that. Those were your words, Professor. So when we talk about uncertainty, and I hear our farmers, and Mr. Schrader and I were asked to lead this letter by the Farm Bureau. Our farmers, which grow the food that feed Americans and actually feed many around the world, are scared to death of this overreach and what it might mean. And again, it goes back to uncertainty. It goes back to the, the fact that outreach was not made to small business, to the farming community and the like. Frankly, the rule needs to be returned. That's what Mr. Schrader and I and 229 other members of Congress have simply asked at this point. They got too far out ahead, as, you, as has been pointed out. 2008, 2009, 2010 it is fundamentally flawed as a, as a beginning data point. And the fact that uh, we haven't done a true economic analysis uh, is, I think, a reasonable request that we have made. Simply return the rule. Let, let's, let's take this off the fast track that it's on. Let's get back to regular order. Let's do what we should be doing. And I think I'm confident uh, with the input of the Farm Bureau, the home builders, the construction trades. Uh, we are not making a mountain out of a molehill. And uh, my other concern, and maybe I will just ask for a brief comment, is on the effect on the economy and jobs. We, ha we have an economy that is sputtering, that has lost uh, steam. Uh, our, our kids are graduating. They don't have the jobs. We need to grow our way out of, out of the deficits and debt problem we have. And just, you know, Mr. Field, the simple kind of question, does a rule like this, because I certainly believe it, it's another uh, hindrance in our growing our economy, uncertainty brings lack of investment, certainly like your opinion. You have just hit the nail on the head, sir. The, the lack of clarity on this rule, regardless of the uh, industry you are involved in, not knowing, not being able to tell your lender with certainty that the activity you are about to enter into is not going to carry the the potential legal liability of a violation of the Clean Water Act or the ability to have the citizens' uh, suit provision of Section right. 505, it's, it's unthinkable. Uncertainty means lack of investment. Mr. Parks? Yes, just to, to add to what Mr. Field indicated, um, most of our holdings, I would say roughly 80 percent are leased. Uh, the, the, these issues affect private landowners. It's not just Memphis Stone or Gravel Company. And so bottom line is, is if we are able uh, if, if the rules require uh, more area subject to regulation, then that certainly can limit the amount of resources that we can recover. And that translates into uh, cost and value to the property owner as well as us. Yeah. Mr. Woods. Yes, it's going to have a, yes, it's going to have a, a devastating effect. I'll give you an example. One of my subdivisions in Mr. Graves' district has over 800 units if it were built out. It would be subject to this. It is, in fact, the one that I mentioned took two and a half years and several hundreds of thousands of dollars to get the permit in the first place under the old rule. I wouldn't go forward with getting it under the new rule. But if you take that and just extrapolate it, every house or every unit by our standards means about 3.7 jobs. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at the tax bills and burdens and what they generate, it's in the thousands of dollars to the municipality and the state and the federal government. And that's just one subdivision. I'm not the big developer in Kansas City. I'm just one of the medium-sized guys, but you'd have to take that number and add it and then go across the country and say how many are there. You're talking millions of jobs that will be lost simply because we cannot get the permits. Yeah. Thank you all very much. Uh, real quick, Mr. Parks, our time's expired, but Congressman, if I could just add that our biggest customers are DOTs, Mississippi Department of Transportation, Tennessee Department of Transportation. They have to deal with the same issues that we as industry have to deal with in getting, determining what's jurisdiction and getting permits to do what they do. Right. Thank you. Uh, thank you all very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to the ranking member. Uh, appreciate uh, everyone's testimony today. Uh, Mr. Field, uh, <clears throat> in your testimony, uh, you mentioned that 
for business and moral reasons, you protect the quality of water around your ranch. And yes, sir. That is very admirable. Uh, however, in my home district, uh, which takes in Newark, New Jersey, and um, surrounding communities, we have the Passaic River, uh, which was a uh, place where a lot of industry was created in the 1800s and 1900s and uh, really um, drove a lot of the industrial um, revolution around um, uh, cities. Newark is the third oldest city in the country. Uh, but it became a dumping ground. Um, Agent Orange was produced uh, in Newark, New Jersey, and a lot of uh, issues that we still have with the river uh, come from the dioxins and those type um, those type of uh, different agents. Uh, so do you really think that we can rely on moral integrity of businesses to not pollute our nation's waters? I mean, everyone is, you know, and I commend you, and it's around your ranch, and that's important to you because that's where you are. But do you think we can rely on um, businesses not to pollute or follow your your example. Well, that, that's an excellent uh, question, Congressman, and I certainly understand uh, your concerns where you sit. And it's, you also bring up an excellent point. Effectively, what, what I would recommend, I think the best decision for your problem is, is the solution will be found locally in New Jersey, not by me in Washington State saying, well, I think the best way to clean up your reach of river, it, the local decisions. I'm not, no one is, nobody on this panel is saying we don't think we need to be able to regulate and protect water quality. When I go out to the tap to get a drink of water, I want to make sure it's safe. I want to make sure you and your family have safe water. But I, I don't believe creating a rule that doesn't clearly define, and as, a, as one that will be covered under the regulation, that I, I need to know clearly, is this jurisdictional, is this not, just what it means. But to your point, in terms of being able to address your water quality issues, I absolutely think that solutions can be found locally, watershed by watershed. The most effective way to address the issue on your river is to get the local, all the stakeholders together, whether it be a, a total maximum daily load, a TMDL, get everybody there that's on the water body, identify what the issue is, and collaboratively come up with a solution. If there's buy-in from everybody, it, you can certainly address the issue. Yeah, and, and, well, and that's a, a very good point. Um, the key there is buy-in, uh, but, you know, as I stated, uh, you protect the water around your ranch. Uh, a lot of these larger industries, the people that are involved in that business, don't live in that community, so it doesn't mat matter very much to them what their water quality is in that area. So my concern and what we're trying to do is make sure that uh, we can make sure that everyone has the same opportunity uh, in their community to have safe drinking water. Are, are you, are these all non-point facilities or are these point source uh, facilities as well as non-point? Because I'm a non-point, I'm a non-permitted facility right now. Right. Uh, if you're talking about a chemical manufacturer, that's a point source. If they're permitted to discharge up whatever their discharge is into a water body, that they're regulated right now under EPA and if I'm not sure if you're delegated, but you may have a state authority regulating that as well. But uh, there is regulation, and if they violate the numbers, terms of their permit, that's most certainly uh, something that can be penalized. But it, it's a little difficult if we're talking about uh, the applicability of point source regulation to non-point operations as well. Well, I mean, you know, and, and that's quite true, but, uh, you know, what we find is um, people tend to like to cut corners. And... Um, even though they are regulated, there are situations where we find that they have not followed the rules. So that, that is the actual uh, important piece of that. You know, uh, according to the EPA, over 117 million people uh, drink from water systems in areas that currently lack full and clear protection under the law. Uh, do you think it would be fair to exempt the polluter from the Clean Water Act, which would, uh, you know, force them, uh, force a community to pay for the cleanup of its water supply? Uh, I'd like to ask um, Professor Busby, the whole panel, please. Um, I, 
I, I think that the, the, the need for clear prohibitions so people know what to do so they're not disadvantaged in business has been shown again and again. So having clear rules, I think everyone at the, at the table here would agree, clear rules are important, but it is important that you, not to rely on just self-policing, that that does tend to be a recipe for disaster. Okay, and um, my time is up, but quickly, if you could each give a quick, brief answer. Mr. Woods? I'm not sure that I have the expertise to... Uh, I'm not sure that I have the expertise to uh, address your problem directly. As an old mayor, I believe that the best people to deal with it in the community are those people in the local community. They have the best knowledge of it, uh, and I think that they can uh, come up with the best solution, quite frankly. Thank you, sir. Congressman, if I may, uh, all of our projects require extensive site review. Uh, we, we open it up at the local level. Uh, there are tremendous opportunities for public participation. Uh, most of our projects are governed by site-specific conditional use permit where conditions can be imposed on that at the local level. Uh, both of our states, Mississippi and Tennessee, are authorized to, to implement the Federal NPDES programs. And, and with regard to water pollution in general, uh, our company, the, the, the companies in our industry, and I would, I would suggest probably to, to most industry, you, you can't just allow water to discharge off your site uncontrolled. Uh, there's an extensive framework that's, that's there already that, that governs how you manage uh, any, any waters that leaves your site, whether it be processed water or storm water. Uh, there's, I mean, we have to develop a pretty extensive stormwater pollution prevention plan for every one of our projects that details exactly how we will manage stormwater runoff before it can impact anything. And, and those, those sites are open for inspection. Um, they are inspected by, by state and federal regulators. All right. Thank you. And um, Mr. Field, I've, I've gone way over my time, so I've, I'll yield back to the chair. Thank you. Mr. Luktemeyer. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it is uh, interesting that we are discussing this uh, rule today because I know the chairman and I fought this battle a couple, three years ago uh, whenever the uh, uh, various powers that be tried to do the same thing with a nav you know, take the word navigable out of, uh, out of the uh, Clean Water Act here. And here we are again today back in the same situation. And so I know uh, Mr. Busby with his comments <clears throat> indicated that uh, we have had the Clean Water Act basically in force and uh, with EPA the authority to make rules for over 30 years. And I think we've seen uh, probably some good things come out of that from the standpoint uh, we have much better clean water today. But uh, as we see over the last few years, last number of years, bureaucracy tends to expand its limits, expand its authority, and it seems that we're in this process now. If you look at what's going on with the administration, uh, that's where the biggest fear, why we're looking at this rule in this light, that there's this tremendous fear of overreach. And I think that the uh, gentleman from Oregon and the gentleman from uh, New York behind me here both uh, were very articulate in, in explaining the concerns that they have, the amount of overreach here from the standpoint that there is this fear that it continues to be that this administration will overreach bureaucratically every time there's a rule or regulation that goes one step beyond what their intent is, and therefore it impacts our business community in a very negative way. And I appreciate um, all of you being here today. Uh, I think, you know, if this rule goes forward, I see no way that it doesn't wind up in the Supreme Court, because this is something that's going to impact all of three uh, the, the business people before us today in a way that's going to drive you either, you know, to have extreme amount of costs or drive you completely out of business. And so I guess my question to each one of the three of you to begin with is, Mr. Field, if this thing goes forward, are you going to be able to stay in business? I honestly don't know. It would depend on whether or not EPA would determine the parcels that I graze to be within their jurisdiction or not. And that I can't honestly a answer that. I'm sorry. Mr. Parks. Well, the, the question may be uh, at what cost will we stay in business? I mean, there are, there are limits. I mean, assuming that, that you know, the... Uh, you know, the cost increases can be supported, uh, perhaps. But, but, you know, who's to know? I mean, it, there's a limit on, on what we can absorb. What it will definitely do is reduce the amount of resources that we can recover um, and, and will make uh, permitting a much more complicated endeavor. 
And as a small company, we try to manage as much as that in-house as possible. Uh, we try to avoid going to consultants uh, because that is a cost that we can't uh, afford to bear uh, because that is a trade-off. Mr. Woods, I think you have kind of already uh, answered that before, but you want to get on record one more time, get one more hammer at this? I would, if you don't <laughs> mind. Uh, quite frankly, I would. Punch, punch your button, please. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Quite frankly, I doubt that we would stay in business, and I doubt that most builders and small developers would stay in business. You, you have to remember one thing. The costs that are incurred are before you can do anything. So there is not a return until you get the delineation of whether you are involved or not involved. And that doesn't mean that your plan is going to be accepted. There is a huge capital outlay here before you ever get one, you, one cent of return on your investment. And, and it all has to be recovered at some point, hopefully from the sale of your property and, for, and other homes. And I think we don't understand small business. Right. For the most part, small business is mom and pop. And it's mom and pop making a living for their family so that the kids can go to college. And if you've got a decision to make between spending $200,000 to see if you might be able to develop a small piece of ground and come up with a plan that might then, two, three, four, five years later, get a permit, I can tell you the kids' college or the dental bill is going to win out. Uh, one of the things that concerns me, it seems like this is a solution in search of a problem from the standpoint that uh, what are we trying to solve here? Professor Busby, can you tell me what we are trying to solve by the expansion of this rule to go as far as these gentlemen think it's going to go? What is it? Where is the problem uh, that we're solving when you impact jobs at this level that they're talking about here today? Um, uh, I guess first, to it's important to remember the Clean Water Act is not limitless in its reach. And so you do have to show that something is a tributary wetland, adjacent wetland, yeah, navigable but water. These but gentlemen have all testified here today that they believe if they interpret this to the, to, the, to the lengths at which you can go, at which attorneys will stretch the law, which has been the case time and time again, with, especially with this administration, this is where we're headed. Um, so where where's the problem um, that this is going to this is trying to solve? Um, I, I, my sense here is that the that this is inaccurate. That the that people will be able to build and people like Mr. Field will continue to have thriving cattle businesses. Not everything needs to be put in a tributary or a wash or a river or a wetland. There's plenty of land where businesses can thrive. The Clean Water Act is really about where you put these things and where you discharge pollutants. Well, Ms. Professor, I I. I I appreciate you living in a uto utopian society. Unfortunately, these three gentlemen don't live there. They live in the real world, and they've explained how the impact of this is going to be in the real world on real people, on real jobs and real livelihoods. And this is what this committee is all about today. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. <coughs> Mr. Bentvolio. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank the Chairman for holding this important hearing. I would also like to thank the witnesses for taking part today and helping to enlighten us about the new Waters of the United States rule. When I read your testimonies, it made me wonder if the EPA purposely makes vague and controversial rules simply so that bureaucrats over there can see their office and newspaper headlines. Just a few weeks ago, I held a hearing in my district about the impact of federal regulations on small businesses in Michigan. Mr. Woods, one of those who testified was Richard Kligman of Superb Custom Homes out of Plymouth, Michigan. He, too, brought the waters of the United States rule and concluded this way. These federal cons consultants related to the clean, excuse me, co consultations related to the Clean Water Act are just another layer of red tape that the federal government has placed on small businesses, and it is doubtful the agencies will be equipped. This nonsense has to stop, Mr. Chairman. Everyone here wants to protect our environment, but we also want to help people in our country succeed and prosper. I don't think that those are mutually exclusive so long as the EPA is proposing rules that are easily understood and, made, and make common sense. Unfortunately, this time it doesn't seem to. But I would like to go one step further. And, you know, Mr. Chairman, um, you know, I went to uh, my wife said we had to replace uh, the water closet in our bathroom. And so I went to uh, our favorite hardware store and uh, tried to find a, um, a water closet, a toilet that uh, would just take enough water, you know, and they said, no, I'm sorry, we, the only toilets we can sell now are regulated to how much water can be flushed down at a time. And I asked the, the salesman why that is. He says, well, we have to conserve water. And I said, well, you know, I live on a farm. We have a well and a septic. I recycle all my water. You know, that's how it works. Why, you know, the government has this, 
this uh, one size fits all. I also have a pond on my farm, and I've been recently notified after this hearing that the EPA is really concerned about the um, toxins in the pond. Well, you know, uh, we live on a dirt road in the country, and all the ditches on the dirt road, um, somehow, you know, there's about 60 acres, feeds my pond, which then drains about two miles further downstream into some, I think it's the Rouge River, the, excuse me, eventually. Um, but why am I suddenly responsible for the, the toxins that run off the road into my pond, all right? So do, do I have to, um, is the EPA going to regulate ditches like that and how they run into the pond? I understand some of these concerns, but I've made those um, uh, arrangements on my own without the EPA. I built uh, uh, berms made of gravel, gravel, right? And uh, it naturally cleans up, sand and gravel naturally cleans up the toxins in my, uh, that re were reaching my pond, right? And um, so I'm wondering, do I have to get EPA requirements and permits to do that? Or is that something I can do on my own because that's probably the wisest thing for me to do? Why do I have to have a government regulator telling me what I have to do for every single uh, facet of my life? Mr. Parks, should I ask a question now? <laughs> Sorry. I don't like the EPA. As far as I'm concerned, China needs the EPA. So we can send 15,000 employees to China for five years. I think we'd all be better off. Well, I would say ditto, but we do have to work with these folks, so I'm, I'm not going to go there. But um, it, you, you do hit the nail on the head. Uh, you know, as I read through the, through the definitions, it's hard for us to see what would not be jurisdictional or potentially could be interpreted that way. And that's really the problem. It opens a lot of things up to interpretations. Even exclusions aren't clear. One part removes artificial ponds created by diking dry land, uh, yet a, tri a tributary can be a man-made pond or a ditch. So which is it? I mean, we, uh, we create a lot of ditches. We create a lot of basins, a lot of ponds that can sit there for 10, 20, 30 years before we're ready to close them down. And so it's a, it's a big question for us. Are we creating all this jurisdictional area uh, through our business processes? Thank you very much. Um, I think I've done my ranting. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Thank Mr. you. Mr. King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the witnesses for your, um, for your testimony. I uh, have a little bit of reminiscing I went through as I listened to some of this, too, but I, I wanted to turn uh, to Professor Busby first and um, ask this question. We've got, the, we've got the issue out here of significant nexus, but there's another term that is back in the dusty reaches of my mind called waters hydrologically connected to. And I would ask Professor Busby, um, are you familiar with the term, and would you define that for this committee, please? Um, the exact term, I'm not sure, but I think what you're probably referring to is in case Riverside Bayview Homes, the unanimous Supreme Court upheld jurisdiction uh, and for waters that had to, essentially were wetlands near other waters. And, um, and part of the grounds for that was the importance of taking into account hydro hydrologic connections and the importance that they serve. But what is a hydrologic connection? Um, the hydrologic connection, as in that case and subsequent cases and the new regulations, as I understand it, um, has to do with whether, essentially, whether water is moving from one place into another, uh, which they look at through several different kind of functional Stagnant analyses. Stagnant water wouldn't be hydrologically connected? I'm sorry, I missed Stagnant that. water wouldn't be hydrologically connected? If the water is truly isolated, so it's not flowing, though, that I would see. not be. Uh, so if it is, then, then it wouldn't be necessarily the flow as it would be the connection. So if you had uh, two ponds and a conduit between them, say a small, um, uh, just, just a, a stagnant stream, but as long as you could, say, uh, float a small boat, that would be hydrologically connected? Um, I don't believe so. I think that the, I, I don't think that's correct. I, I, the, if, the way they talk about it, they look at different regions. I think what you'd be describing would be what appears to be an isolated water, and then the question is whether that because they, of it. But if it's two ponds and there and there is a very small non-flowing stream between the two of those, would those two ponds be hydrologically connected? 
I th the way hydrologically connected worked is I think they were ultimately talking about ultimately connecting to navigable waters or navigable, in fact, yes. waters. And I, yes, and, and, I, I, and, I, and I agree with that definition. And I, and I bring this up in, in, in part of this discussion about significant nexus. And uh, I, I think I'll do this. I'll tell the narrative. Um, back in about 1994, first I'd, I'd let the uh, committee know that I've spent my life in soil conservation, water quality. I've built more terraces probably than anybody in Congress or waterways or any kind of retention ponds you want to describe. It's been my life. And I remember walking into my construction office one night in about 1994, and there stood a farmer, and he said, did you see this DNR rule that they have published for comment? And I read the rule, and it said, these 115 streams are proposed to be protected streams. These streams to their geographical boundaries and, quote, waters hydrologically connected to them, close quote. And I went straight up in the air because I believe in property rights and I oppose property takings by government or anybody else. It, at that time, was a, it was a Fifth Amendment um, property rights issue before Kelo and went straight to Cherokee, Iowa for the, for the public comment hearing. And I asked them the question, define it for me, hydrologically connected. They said, well, we can't. And I said, then take it out of the rule. Well, we can't. How can you tell me you can't define it and you can't take it out? Then if you can't define it, you can't tell me why it's there. Then the next night the hearing was in Algona, Iowa, and that was two hours up there, and they saw me coming and said, only one question per customer. Well, you can imagine that I did not walk away from that microphone until I'd asked a lot of them. Uh, subsequent to that, I ran for the Iowa, for the Iowa Senate because I had been boxed out of a hearing as a witness. They wouldn't really let me testify to the answer to this. So this goes pretty deep to me. And when I see the language here that we're dealing with and the, and the stretch of the rules, I know how rules get stretched. And uh, I've lived it, and so have a lot of the members of this committee. We're dealing with the traditional navigable waters of the United States. That goes back to 1948, or excuse me, 1848, when the Corps of Engineers was granted the authority to remove the debris from the navigable waters. Then, now we've yet added to that, uh, the, the definition has been expanded through litigation and some statute, uh, but also now including interstate waters and wetlands, the territorial seas, impoundments of the first three categories and tributaries, tributaries of the first four categories, and uh, number six, waters and wetlands adjacent to the first five, but the language of other waters, which is all of these categories that I've described, including riparian areas, floodplain tributaries, significant nexus. When I see that language that says significant nexus, that's the 2014 term that substituted for waters hydrologically connected to. And I will define hydrologically connected to. It's real simple. It's whenever two mo water molecules touch each other. You can make the argument that they're hydrologically connected. You can argue the case law that's out there and how it's been interpreted. But in the end, if two water molecules touch, it's hydrologically connected. If you take a piece of nice, nice good, well-moistened, freshly rained upon Iowa black soil, it's about 25% moisture today. Water molecules touch. They go all the way up through your streams that water your cattle and all the way up to these homes that you're developing and all the way into everybody's property in the United States only by the stretch of the definitions that are put in these rules. And I, I would just pose one final question quickly um, to Professor Busby, and that is, do you believe that if the federal government regulates the complete usage of property away from our property owners, whether it's the ranchers, whether it's developers, if they regulate the utilization of that property away and render it without value to the owner, is that a takings under the Constitution? I think if you if you're phrasing it like the Lucas case by the Supreme Court that a 100 percent taking of all use would be a taking under that precedent. Useless to the owner um, for the purpose of the rendering it without value actually was the way it talked about so it's, it gets more complicated in the subsequent cases. We're but. close to a yes though and I'll settle for that and I appreciate all your testimony and I yield back to the chairman. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Wood. Um, in your uh, testimony you stated that any waters or wetlands within a floodplain can be subject to the Clean Water Act. Um, mm -hmm. I was just curious, or Clean Water Act jurisdiction, how that's going to affect uh, your industry, your business. Um, you know, what impact is that going to have? Thank you. I'll speak to it relative to uh, uh, the Midwest and the Plain States, wherever you want to put us. Uh, as you well know, I mean, if you're in Independence, Missouri, Blue Springs, Missouri, you're close to the Missouri River, you're close to the Little Blue and the Big Blue and the Caw, and we've got tons of what has been called for years bottom ground, 
and you cannot, uh, your first problem is you cannot uh, get yourself too far away from uh, floodplains or wetlands. The, the, the second problem that you have in that definition, and that's the one that probably bothers me more, in too many cases, the maps that are used and have been used to delineate these cases are erroneous. We've seen situations, uh, one specific situation in Riverside, Missouri, where the floodplain was halfway up the hill. It's not where the creek is. Now, I defy you to put a floodplain halfway up a hill and not in the creek. Uh, and it took us almost two and a half years to get a determination and a change in the flood map. We had to go in and prove that you know, the water didn't usually run across the hill halfway up. It usually ran at the creek. So those are the kinds of problems you're going to run into is it isn't that it's truly a floodplain or it isn't that it's truly a wetlands. Uh, the case that I pointed out here, the very first thing we did in the, uh, in the subdivision that I'm talking about in Independence, Missouri, just to put it into perspective, was we had uh, consultants come in and walk our site. It's almost 500 acres. It's a, uh, a bottom land field, but it's not floodplain. And uh, actually, it had been prior converted, which I just find out now may have changed. But it had been farmed for 150 years. There were none there. There were none found. And, uh, and yet, we still ended up subject to, because we were close enough, we were adjacent uh, to some things. We felt it best that we move forward, try to move forward in a very positive way. Uh, thought we were being wise, and we brought everybody out, let them tour the site, and tried to put in place um, uh, the very best of practices uh, and show off. And uh, as I was told by city engineer and independents, we were justly rewarded for our good deeds. Two and a half years and $250,000 later, we got a permit. That's what concerns me the most. Well, and you mentioned, too, and, and there are some carve-outs, uh, as has been pointed out by Professor Busby. However, it also states adjacent to jurisdictional waters, and that's what concerns me as much as anything else. And in closing, I want to kind of build on what uh, Mr. Luke Meyer said uh, as well. We've fought this before, um, removing the term navigable out of the Clean Water Act, and we fought it under two different majorities, and it failed Congress. This failed uh, the people's house um, by folks that are voted on by constituents. And now here we are fighting it, coming at it from a regulatory standpoint by individuals who are not elected, uh, who are not responsible to, uh, uh, to anyone. And that's the most frustrating part. Uh, the will of the people was done, and this was defeated. And now here we are uh, going through this process uh, under agency uh, proposed uh, rulemaking, uh, and it's frustrating. Um, but all of this testimony has showed us that the waters of the United States or this proposed rule is going to have a significant impact uh, on small businesses. Um, and the EPA and the Corps failed to do the assessments uh, that they were supposed to do uh, under the Regulatory Flexibility Act. And that's another thing that bothers me uh, as much as anything else, because when agencies fail to comply with the RFA, uh, the result is always poorly crafted regulations, and it's going to impose a lot of unnecessary and costly burdens on small business. Uh, and this is going to be uh, the case. And we're going to be closely monitoring this and the development of this rule, uh, and we're going to be engaging the, uh, all of the agencies until they come in full compliance with the RFA. And with that, I would ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record. Without objection, that is so ordered. And with that, I appreciate all of you coming in and your testimony. Hearings adjourned.